Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and the mother figures that are listening. I, um, at the time of recording this, my youngest son is turning 18 tomorrow. The baby is turning 18. He's going to be an adult. Um, and the 20 year old is on his way home tomorrow from college. So I will be a happy, happy mama to have a full house. And I hope that all the mamas are having a great Mother's Day. I just wanted to also send my love to those who have lost a child or lost children. I don't think that there is any greater pain than losing a child. So I wanted to send out some love to any mamas that have lost a child. This particular episode is with a doula. She, Nico Kennedy, is a beautiful, bright soul that I know through the Quantum Biology Collective. She and I have both trained in quantum biology, applied quantum biology, that is. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about Nico's story. She's, oh, it's, she's really bright and she always has amazing questions. And we have great conversations on the Quantum Biology Collective calls. So, I wanted to have her on and I thought it would be great for Mother's Day to have a doula talking about um, all kinds of quantum health related things, but in relationship to having babies, to wanting to have babies, having babies, and then postpartum after we have them, how to keep the whole family healthy. And we, we talked um, about circadian rhythms, mostly about circadian rhythms and some mitochondria um, mitochondrial health, and then also nutrition. So we both have um, some things to say about nutrition. So I hope that this episode is refreshing for you to hear. It may, even if you are not a mama <laughs> or wanting to be a mama, I think it will be refreshing for you to hear some more about quantum uh, health and quantum health strategies. So happy healing and thank you for being here and thank you for listening well welcome to the show nico i'm so excited to talk to you about all things quantum health related yeah me too thanks for having me on yeah so i thought it might be a good place to start to just say tell me a little bit about how you made your way to quantum biology and the quantum biology collective yeah absolutely so i came here kind of through my own personal healing journey like Many like, folks did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Through my own learning, I just, you know, I discovered the light aspect of everything. And that was kind of the first place that I started. And fashion, I'm a doula. And so I help women through the childbearing experience. Yeah. And a little, a couple, a few years ago, I realized that the quantum biology really affected the pregnancy process. And I wanted to learn more about that through someone on Instagram who is it little pioneer woman Charlotte do you know uh, Charlotte I don't know yeah. I, I probably do know Charlotte okay well anyway um, I should <laughs> yeah. I, yeah I ran into her account and she said she's circadian certified so I thought like wow you know that would be perfect I was kind of thinking of creating a certification or something but I really just want to focus on you know pregnancy birth postpartum so I was really happy to find the Quantum Biology Collective and they were able to help fill in some gaps that I had because I was a self-study. Although I do have a degree in biology and psychology. Yeah, I was going to say, you're very sciencey and your questions <laughs> on the calls, I'm like, wow, you really, for somebody who is self-study, you obviously had a background to understand things. Exactly. I was poised to to be able to read the research because my degree. So originally I was going to become an OBGYN. And then I realized that was not the actual path that I wanted to go. And so at the last minute in my degree, I took a hard swerve towards science writing. <laughs> and so my last classes were all just how to read papers and translate them into something that makes sense to everyday people. So that's really what I'm trying to do with my quantum work. Yeah. And you're really good at that. You're really good at taking the science and helping us all understand it a little bit better. And I love your work. I love that you're working with the mamas and you're helping moms pre-birth, during birthing, and also postpartum, which is mm -hmm. you know such a hard <laughs> time for a lot of us. It's beautiful and, and stressful all at the same time. 
So it might be helpful if people, if I don't know how many people understand circadian rhythms, and that might be a good thing for us to just say, what do we mean by circadian rhythms? Sure, absolutely. So the simplest thing is the circadian rhythms, the, they make sure that everything that needs to happen in the body happens at the right time. So it's just a matter of having A before B before C. Um, and the body doesn't function as well if things are trying to fire out of order. And right. so <laughs> there's a couple of ways that that rhythm is entrained. And I think there's a common misconception that it's all about the alarm clock. Mm -hmm. And what is actually more important than the alarm clock is the light signals. And then the second most important are the feeding signals. So that's part of where I was really excited to talk with you because I know you do a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so in pregnancy, there's kind of this misconception that if you eat a good diet, that's all you need to do to have a healthy pregnancy. It's really common, just, you know, diet, 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 diet. Mm -hmm. And I know through your journey, I've listened to some of your podcasts and we've talked a little bit before and how you kind of came up to the wall of how far diet can take a person without addressing the quantum. And then conversely, there is this kind of piece in the quantum biology world where they say, you know, if you have everything in your light environment and, you know, quantum right, then you could eat doo-doo on a shingle and be fine. And so <laughs> that doesn't really apply to the pregnancy. It may apply to people in other phases of life. And so I was hoping with our conversation that we could kind of get at where the nutrition and the quantum biology meet. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? Love, you, have I you seen that. that kind of dichotomy of like- Yes, of course. Of course. And I would love to get to the point where I could eat, you know, poop on a shingle and that would be totally fine. I just am not there. I, my clients aren't there. Certainly mm -hmm. not there. And that's such a good, I mean, so important to think about in terms of pregnancy because, and even what to eat, people are confused about that. But I never even considered what time of day was better for us. And really what's so important, I've learned through reading your work and seeing your work is that we get our circadian rhythms from our mama. Yeah. Like it's really our mitochondria come from our mama. We also get our microbiome, which is really important for our health and our mental health. So that microbiome, the first microbes that we get are from birth so, right. and then breastfeeding and then the environment that we're in. So if our mama is if her circadian rhythms are all messed up and so she's totally off and her mama went and if everybody was off then we're off and so to re to reorient ourselves which is actually not hard to do you just have to know how to do it yeah that's that's the key so if somebody's listening and they ha are thinking about having children you want to get your your life you want to fix your life so you're supporting your circadian rhythms. But if you've already had kids, that's okay. And if you're like, I need to get myself figured out, that's okay. Wherever you are, it's, yeah. it's never too late to figure this stuff out, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I I love that with, um, I'm sure that you're familiar with the sundowning and dementia effects, but they, you know, there's the only thing that works for people that are getting that symptom with their dementia. So that's obviously end of life. Um Mm -hmm. stabilizing circadian rhythms is the only thing that works you can't get there by any kind of medication so yeah it's absolutely never too late <laughs> <laughs> never never and yeah. most people don't realize how important circadian rhythm is and so mm -hmm. we think of sleep and wake everyone's like oh our sleep wake cycle I don't think people realize that there are other circadian signals mm -hmm. to, that we need to pay attention to and also I don't think people even realize what the light and dark, how to honor that. So where do you start when you have somebody coming to you that has no idea about circadian rhythms? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I think if a person is curious and ready for change, you know, cause that's always a thing. I definitely have clients that are not ready for any of this and we don't touch it. And I have all this wisdom and my lips are zipped, um, <laughs> which can be frustrating, but in the, you know, the moment, like sometimes I'll meet a mama and then several days later we're at her birth. And so there isn't any time to get into any of this. And right. so that's where I kind of 
also have um, a publication where I'm writing about this. And so that's where I get more of those people and can lead in. And for me, my journey started with fixing evening light. And I think yeah. there are some good reasons to start with evening light. It's kind of the place we have the most disruption. And I think it's easier than getting to the point of dawn. Um, <laughs> if you <laughs> have been staying up until two or three in the morning, then saying, oh, you need to see sunrise is kind of just, you know, it's a really big jump for people. Right. And so for me, starting with melatonin is really un easy to understand. There's mm -hmm. so much research and then just fixing the evening lighting environment, turning lights down low that sets the stage so a person can actually get a good night's rest and be ready to face dawn. Of course, the morning sunlight is what sets the rhythm. You kind of have that initial window after you wake up to go outside and get light to really program things to be on a good track for the whole day. But I just see that it's more feasible for a lot of people to start with turning the lights down after dinner. It's kind of the easiest thing, I think. And that was a step that I started with too. So I might have a little bias there. Yeah, it's fun. I love it because I started with morning. So I tend to start people there. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it doesn't matter. And I think you're right. It might be the place. It's where we have the most disruption. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. People are like, I can't get out in the morning, especially if you already have kids. And yeah. morning can be a hectic time. So mm -hmm. to get your sleep better and get your melatonin right. And just to educating people on melatonin because babies, they don't make their own melatonin. That's and right. so um, newborns, they get mm -hmm. that from us. And so we want to make sure we're making the melatonin, which is, you know, made from serotonin, which is made earlier in the day. So the right. light, getting in the light matters, but then getting dark, honoring the dark, dimming the lights, wearing blue blockers after sunset, all the things that we can, you know, get red light bulbs and covering mm -hmm. the fridge light with a red <laughs> cellophane or whatever, like all yeah. these things that we end up doing, but you're really helping your babies when you're doing that too. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a great place to start. And, and it makes a lot of sense because some people, <laughs> they're just not, they're not morning people yet. And exactly. And yeah. I love when people are like, Kelly, I don't even need my coffee. I go straight outside. And you're like, all right, there you go. I'm okay yeah. with you keeping your coffee. But I mean, they they bypass the coffee to get straight outside first. Mm -hmm. And I just think, you know, then we're really getting somewhere when people start. Yeah. They really start working on their relationship with the sun mm -hmm. and fixing and honoring, really, I guess, being respectful of the dark too yeah exactly right? that's that's what I see is really important is to have the balance of both and in mm -hmm. pregnancy melatonin um climbs and climbs and climbs up till the moment of birth is when there's actually peak melatonin and we know that women tend to feel more comfortable giving birth in a dark setting and part of that is that melatonin is synergistic with oxytocin so when a woman has really high circulating melatonin it synergizes with that oxytocin to give stronger contractions. And it also feels less painful. Women that have higher circulating melatonin report less pain, even though their contractions are actually stronger, which is really a really great thing yeah. <laughs> for people that did do experience labor as painful. Not all women do, but many women do. Uh -huh. So if they can keep their circulating melatonin and that's where um, there can be some challenge with the transition. And it's really common for women when they transition to a birthing facility from home that they will experience a stall in their labor. Mm -hmm. And that can be partially from the adrenaline um, kicking in from transitioning to a new place, but also from the really bright lights going through the hallways, getting checked in, all of that. You know that it takes two to three hours for melatonin to really circulating once you get back into that dark environment. It really has implications over a long term, but it also in pregnancy can have this really acute interaction with the labor and delivery process. Well, and in oxytocin, I'm also thinking for postpartum depression and for being able to bond with your baby. I never thought about melatonin being involved there, but of mm -hmm. course it is. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And I never thought about, I just, my birthing plan and my, my child is 20 and the other one will be 18 tomorrow. So, right. I was like, my plan is to leave with the baby, <laughs> have a baby, 
Yeah. And everybody leave alive. That's, that was mm-hmm. the plan. And I wish that I had known some more of this, just about lighting too, mm-hmm. because I probably would have at least changed the lighting in, in the facility. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. No, well. And, you know, babies generally want to come out that, you know, if they're, you know, they want to come out, they want to be born. And so the process does work, but we are in a place in the U.S. where our, mater- our maternal mortality rates are not keeping pace with the rest of the world. And so we're kind of at a disadvantage compared with other places in the world. And so a lot of people are trying to unpack and figure out why is it that American women are having such a harder time through their births than other women around the world and trying to divide up and figure out where, where it's happening. And the best estimates are that about 60% of the factors that are leading to these um, more maternal mortality rates mm-hmm. are in the home, lifestyle choices that lead to mm-hmm. poor health, obesity, chronic illnesses. And so doctors and like birthing professionals get a lot of the heat because there are some things where we have higher level of interventions, but it doesn't add up to all of the lifestyle factors that people can make at home to prevent those chronic illnesses. And so when we start looking at preventing chronic illness before pregnancy, that's where, as you know, quantum biology plays a huge role in having a mom set up to have all the resources she needs, not only to get pregnant, but to make it all the way through the birth and postpartum experience healthy. Yeah. And really anybody, I mean, truly quantum biology has so much to offer all of us. So anybody listening, they were like, oh, well, I'm not trying to get pregnant. I'm not pregnant now. Just it's everyone. But what I think is so important is that this isn't really well known. And so we really have to help spread the word for people and for, you, you know, for for you, would do you start with circadian rhythms if somebody's open, or do you just kind of see where they are open? Maybe food, because we're talking about lifestyle, and so mm-hmm. it's how. But it's not what people think. People think exercise. A lot of people will think their sleep is good, and that their sleep is actually not great once they fix their circadian rhythms. I keep saying fix your circadian rhythms. You really fix your life to support your circadian right. rhythms, right? Mm-hmm. So when you get your, your circadian rhythm supported, your timing of things, when you eat, your light environment, we're, and being in nature. So I think that's a key piece too, just for the safety signals. And I think the more a mama can have safety signals from her food, from her light environment, from being in nature, earthing, all of that, the better off the baby is going to be the the better off everybody's going to be through the whole process, but certainly mm-hmm. once the baby's born. Yeah, absolutely. And so my track definitely would be custom depending on what a woman is bringing to me. So for example, a woman who is struggling with high blood pressure, then we're definitely going to be looking at sunshine because sunshine increases vasodilation. So we're going to look at the research and say, Hey, Did you know that if you get out in the UV light, um, that will actually cause your blood vessels to expand and decrease your blood pressure? Whereas a woman who is having a lot of bodily discomfort, we're going to think, okay, you probably aren't getting as good of rest as you need. And so we're going to look at nighttime darkness and how melatonin can help your body heal and deal with the oxidative stress. Alternatively, maybe we'll look at grounding because it could be an inflammation issue. And if she could absorb more electrons from her environment, she would have more energy to do the healing that she needs. And you can just, you know, it's really easy looking at the research to see the pictures like, look, here's someone with joint pain. Here's what it looks like at zero minutes, five minutes, an hour, up to three hours. They've done studies showing just continually decreased inflammation from grounding. Yeah. So that's where it it really each person, depending on what their complaints or symptoms are, Right. might have a different piece that the, is maybe not quite as ideal in their life for their unique situation. Yeah, absolutely. And ideally, you can get people, how early do you like to get people? I mean, it sounds like you meet somebody and sometimes you're you're delivering the baby in a couple of days, but ideally, how soon would somebody start working with you? 
Yeah. Well, mamas deliver their own babies. Right, <laughs> and right, right. Doula, I am a non-medical professional. And so I'm providing, you know, intellectual support, emotional support, physical support. Um, and so in a consulting wise, um, I will work with women at any time. And I've actually been finding a lot more women coming to me who are having fertility issues. And so that's something that I never encountered before. I started talking about circadian rhythms and grounding and quantum biology because before I would only work with women who actually were pregnant. <laughs> and so uh, usually I'm reading pe women towards the end of their pregnancy right. through the birth and then doing postpartum. And in that sense, a lot of the research about doulas is that doulas are great for reducing risk of postpartum mood disorders yes. and initiating healthy breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And so my first 10 years as a doula were almost entirely around creating birth plans and then looking at the postpartum piece. What's, what's the plan for this? And so mm -hmm. now I'm kind of finding this other category of women finding me who are saying, I'm, you know, interested. My husband and I have been trying to conceive for a long time and, you know, it's not working, but it seems like this quantum health could be a factor. So uh it's really interesting how it's yeah. kind of changed uh, the, you know, the, the populations that I'm working with um, mm -hmm. once I decide, once I started speaking up about this. Yeah. Which I think is fascinating too. Yeah. So talk to me about the, the food nutrition. What mm -hmm. in your opinion um, makes the most sense from a quantum perspective, knowing what we know about food and what mamas need um, before, during, and after having a mm -hmm. baby. And yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. Well, there's, there are three things that I kind of have some pretty strong feelings about as far <laughs> as looking at the research and these specific categories of nutrition. Yeah. Um, so one is fluoride. Um, I think looking at the evidence, there's just no reason for a pregnant woman to be drinking fluoridated water, use having fluoridated dental treatments because it directly inhibits melatonin. Mm -hmm. And so we just see that pretty much every problem that women get in pregnancy generally has melatonin and sleep disruption as an underlying factor. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't make sense to do anything during that period of time that could interfere with the melatonin process. So that's one. Um, and then as far as the specific nutrients, like generally nutritional advice, you know, go to your doctor or, you know, whoever your care provider is, they'll give you a meal plan. And there are a couple pieces that I just like to pull, point out the quantum piece, like vitamin D, obviously, if you're in a, if you are pregnant in a time of year where you can get vitamin D, you can get huge doses from the sun that aren't as when you get, like when you get a huge dose of oral vitamin D, it can actually make your body less sensitive to um, vitamin D that you eat after that huge dose. And that doesn't seem to happen with sunshine. Nope. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the vitamin D is a great place to open the conversation about vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. It's so important for pregnancy. Everyone agrees about that. And so let's think about how important the sun itself is for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one is the folate cycle. And right. so all women know about taking folate. And it's another, just like vitamin D, I just like to look a little bit deeper because one of the reasons we need folate is that it gives a particular donor, it's called a methyl group. And that's what the DNA uses to run the circadian rhythm. So in very cruel animal studies, they give extreme folate deprived diet and that will stop the circadian rhythm from functioning because the the genes oh and that's another thing that's really interesting that genes are turning on and off right across the single day um i used to think of it as a more static thing before i really understood what was going on and then learning that it's happening throughout um, the day mm -hmm. throughout the day mm -hmm. and the folate cycle is the main donor of the little snippet of the methyl groups that are used to to tag is this a nighttime process or a daytime process and so that's where I'm in agreement with the mainstream idea that we really need folate and that we can't be risking a pregnant woman getting folate deficient there. And so I just like to bring that piece, like 
part of why that's so important is because it powers the circadian rhythm. Right. And um, we could go into like what it looks like when you have dysfunction there, but I think I want to just right. take nutrients for a second. What do you think about DHA? Oh yeah, of course DHA is super important. Right. <laughs> yeah. The brain Absol- helps. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. To build the baby's brain. And then as we know, that also helps build our ability to tolerate the sun. So of course seafood. Right. And I really like referring people to um, Lily Nichols. She's a registered dietitian and she wrote the book, um, Real Food for Pregnancy. I, and yes, I, I've re- I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, really good on the nutritional piece. Mm-hmm. And so that's like a great resource to bump people to. She talks all about DHA and vitamin D and all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, however, she doesn't have anything. And this is where I was kind of hoping to talk with you a little bit about how um, the local like sun cycle entrains our digestive process. Yeah. Um, so she is all about customizing specifically carbohydrates. Like if you live in Alaska in the middle of winter, your body's not going to tolerate carbohydrates nearly as well as it would if you live in the equator um, yes. because of the way the sun programs our digestive system. So have you done research looking into that or helping clients tailor their diet based on season? Yes. So I'm a big fan, right? And, <laughs> and I was, it just started making sense to me that we want the body to be as oriented as possible to the time of day, the time of year, the season that we're in. And so for eating foods out of season, that aren't grown locally, it may not kill us, right? It's, you know, we can sustain, but it's certainly not, it's going to be disorienting to the mitochondria. It's going to be, and if you're already having some health issues, it just doesn't make sense to me to confuse the body and you're increasing inflammation. You're all of these things. So yes. And what's amazing is when you're, when your sun exposure, so being outdoors particularly early morning, getting that light if people are worried about UV, but you Mm -hmm. really, then you prime yourself. You know this, you talk about this a lot. We can prime the body by being out early morning and at sunset and you prime your body to be out more and more during the day to get Mm -hmm. when you can get UV light. But then you want your food to match, right? The season that you're in and then train our microbes and our gut change based on the the season, the sunlight. And so we're more able to eat things in summer that are growing in summer than, you know, obviously in winter. So I'm a big fan of eating seasonally. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think for a mama to really have the most energy to do what she needs to do to grow a baby, have a baby, (laughs) take care of baby after. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. You want your mitochondria to be as healthy as possible. You want the least amount of inflammation. You're going to have less, you're not going to be as uncomfortable, not have as much pain. Plus everything's going to work better for for baby. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a big fan. And I'm also, I've always been kind of leery of taking things like melatonin and vitamin D unless somebody's truly deficient and they just have to. I mean, we just Mm -hmm. have to because it's too risky for them not to. But um, when we eat seasonally too, I think our body's more able to process things and digest things, but I don't like people taking things that the body makes. So men I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like we don't make minerals. So sure. We can supplement with some minerals, um, and some other things, but when the body makes it, I, I don't think it's a good idea to take it because then mm-hmm. you're telling your body, it doesn't need to make it. <laughs> so, Yeah. Absolutely. I get the melatonin question pretty often because a lot of people do think of it as just a thing that you buy at the store. Right. You just take it. Yeah. You've yeah. been taking it forever. I'm just going to, yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah. And so um, one thing with melatonin that is related to um, birth is there is really good indication that if a woman is having an augmented labor with yeah. synthetic oxytocin, that at that point, that is a time to possibly introduce exogenous melatonin. Melatonin. Mm-hmm. If she's having problems with her oxytocin, then she could be having problems with her melatonin. And so they're seeing that that augmentation of labor, which can be a very intense process for women, yeah. that the melatonin is soothing to that process, the exogenous melatonin 
just the same way that if you have natural oxytocin flowing, the natural melatonin flowing is um, good. So that is the only place that I've seen that. Um, mm -hmm. And then I know that there are some people that have really, really rare, like actual problems with their sleep wake cycle. And mm -hmm. that would only be diagnosed by a you know, true professional. Yeah. Right. Special and so in those cases, I don't know, I haven't done the research there in terms of people who have actual dysfunction with most people, it's lifestyle based. It is. And I, for me, where I see it, where I use it sometimes is trauma. So when somebody's mm -hmm. had significant trauma, particularly in childhood, and if it's been at night, so if their trauma oh. occurred at night and now they have sleep, they're afraid in the night, mm -hmm. they don't like to, you know, it, then sometimes we have to do whatever we have to do to get right. their cells figured out. So I'm not against anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, if there's a way to use, I just use it thoughtfully. Yeah. And, you know, rather than all willy nilly. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, for me, I, I, the entire first pregnancy for me, I had a urinary tract infection. Oh, wow. And my doctor said, I'm going to put you on a low dose antibiotic. And I said, well, is it okay for the baby? And she said, I wouldn't give you anything that was bad for the baby. Mm -hmm. I know. So I have a very, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. still kind of sore about that because, right? I, you know, uh, rightfully so. And I mean, people are a product of their environments. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the hazing that medical professionals go through to get where they're at yeah. is intense. So I try to have compassion, but sometimes they do say things that are, you know, just, not backed up by research and <laughs> no but even and then like also potentially harmful to patients too like just saying like you know trust me don't do your own research, research. Is not yeah it doesn't really make any a healthy um dynamic like that's a power play right. more than like helpfulness or giving information yeah and also you're just basically saying don't trust your gut mm -hmm. <laughs> listen to me and we by all means, want everyone to trust their own intuition, their own gut feelings about something. And if you're not sure, mm -hmm. like do your own research, but yeah, I mean, we're all here and I think I've mm -hmm. done so much healing since then that might not have had to happen <laughs> if we'd had a different, different doc, but that's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah. The, and that's something too, that you know, sometimes women are actually having to change providers once they realize oh, yeah. they're not getting along. And sometimes it's all the way at the very, very end of pregnancy. And that's also something where, you know, like as a doula, they might be bringing things and say, Oh, have you talked with this with your provider? And then they, you know, get kind of like mm, yeah. clam up or like some kind of thing like, Oh, well, you, do you feel comfortable talking with your provider about this? And, you know, then you can kind of open the conversation and, you know, do you actually have the right provider for you? Um, yeah. And don't be afraid to break up. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I really need to break up with <laughs> this provider. I ended yeah. up having a, um, the only man in the practice, like I wanted an all women practice and the only man in there ended up de delivering him and he was phenomenal. I loved him. I should have <laughs> seen him from the beginning, but you know, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's all good, but yeah. he, was, Yeah. I think feeling comfortable, I always talk about it in terms of energetic match, because you can actually really like a practitioner that you work with or a provider, but it's not a, a good match therapeutically, energetically, frequency wise. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that from a scientist, Dr. Valerie Hunt, who used to be able to predict where people were going to get sick because she could see where their energy energetically, they were weak. Mm -hmm. she is to talk about your provider you needs to be strong where you're weak and and vice versa for you to be a good match and that mm -hmm. was always my argument for getting as healthy as possible as a provider because yeah then you're a match for more people <laughs> so <laughs> yeah not that yeah, you can be perfect absolutely. but right it's like mm -hmm. okay well if I'm healing the frequencies and I'm healing as best I can then I'm probably going to be a match for for more people to mm -hmm. help them. So, yeah, I love that perspective. And I mean, it even fits like from psychology, there's yeah. um, attachment relationship theory where they say, you know, mm -hmm. it only takes one secure person for a relationship to thrive. 
but there needs to be one for it to be a healthy dynamic. And so if you can be the one, then you're sure that that relation, even, you know, no matter where the other person's at, if you can be that, you know, mm -hmm. secure person within yourself, then you can have the potential for a healthy relationship, no matter where the other person's coming from. And as a provider, I think that's really important if you're really trying to do a good thing with your work, which of course we are. Yeah, I think we all have our hearts are in the right place. So for you as a as a practitioner, I mean, you're about to have your fourth baby. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so that's exciting. So yeah. How do you what does your day look like? Typical day. I don't know if you have a typical day with three kids. Yeah. Day, but just Absolutely. To make sure that you're doing everything that you can mm -hmm. to um heal as much as you can and to um yeah, to be protective of your circadian rhythms. Yeah, my day starts, my husband and I like to get up and first thing we like to go outside and take a walk, uh, wear our leather-soled shoes. Hopefully the ground is still moist, so we're collecting electrons and catching that first bit of light and um, just kind of walking laps around. And then after that, we come inside and have breakfast and get on with our day. But the first part is tuning in with each other and. Mm -hmm with our environment and that really is helping me feel super strong and supported through this pregnancy and then for the rest of the day it's like a balance between the indoor work that we do like for me I have I'm homeschooling mm -hmm. um my kids and you know often you know I'm generally working on education <laughs> too I love learning and so I usually have some program or other that I'm doing mm -hmm. so I'm working on that and then I'm writing on my blog mm -hmm. and then um yeah, when I have um, client meetings, of course, those will get scheduled in along with all the other activities of the day. But we also always try to make sure to get out in mm -hmm. the bright, the brightest part of the day. And part of this is also with the kids because I have children and I want them to be healthy. And so it's kicking them out of the house um, pretty often. And yeah. so we've been doing the thousand hours outside program. Uh, sure. which I highly recommend for any homeschooling families because they're coming at it. They do touch a little bit on circadian rhythms, but they're coming, they have research on child development from all over. And they were, their first idea was just to match the general amount of screen time most kids are getting with mm -hmm. outdoors time. Mm -hmm. And then they found out like, oh, well, kids who spend about three hours a day outside, like have better academic performance, like better health, like all the things that we found through quantum biology, they were just looking at it in terms of academic Outside time yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of like yeah achievement mm -hmm. <laughs> but still yeah. yeah um so we have a tracker and so my oldest daughter is responsible for tracking and they if they get out before noon they get to fill in an extra little sunshine bubble and they write what the weather is and go and the point is to try to get a thousand hours across the entire year which works out to about three hours a day so obviously depending on your climate some days you might be able to get six hours outside or more Others, you might only be out for 30 minutes because it's just horrible sleet or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like three hours a day. It's like a, a holistic thing. So um, that plays a big um, part in structuring our day to make sure that the kids are getting out at all the quarters, just like I need to get myself out at all the quarters. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, um, it's, you know, a matter of trying to get dinner early enough. I think that's our biggest struggle is trying to get dinner before sunset. It's just so hard. <laughs> it <laughs> Easier is. Easier in the summer. <laughs> yes. Yes. We have it longer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then we wind down in, in the evening. Sometimes my daughter will read bedtime stories or I'll sing lullabies and um, all of us kind of sing together when we do our lullabies, which is so sweet with the youngsters. And I think it's a really, it's just really wholesome. My husband insisted that I learned how to um, sing so that I could sing to the children. And so that's our kind of nighttime thing to settle down and um, try to get to bed early. And then this pregnancy, um, he got me the, the Ura tracker ring. Yep. So I've been tracking my sleep and that's been really interesting. I've never had this kind of data. And so this one, you can turn it on Bluetooth, like Bluetooth off and have it be in airplane mode and it will track for like seven days and then plug it in and get all your data. And so it's been interesting. Like in the first trimester, I was definitely needing to spend a solid 12 hours a day in bed. 
And then one second trimester, I was able to be up and around more. And then here in third trimester, in order to keep my sleep scores up, mm -hmm. I do need about 10 hours a night in bed, plus sometimes an afternoon nap. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. other, and, and you can see, like, otherwise it'll say, oh, your heart rate variability is going down. Like, sounds like you're not getting as much rest as you need and that kind of thing. So that's been an interesting, um, mm -hmm. just having this kind of like data box telling me what I already feel but it's like kind of validating like oh you really did need that nap yeah you really do need to rest mm -hmm. yeah that's the yeah. thing I hear the most with the aura ring is that people think it's going to tell you to exercise more get out and it actually ends up telling you you're overworking yourself <laughs> you're like, oh, okay <laughs> um but it's nice to have that kind of data so yeah. that I mean that's a beautiful way to spend your days with the family and I think mm -hmm. you know for people who work in the offices or are on the go a little bit more. Um, there are ways, you know, there are. Like, mm -hmm. crack the window on the way to carpool. Yeah. Take, take light breaks. You, you just work it out so that. Mm -hmm. you're, yeah. yeah. And so then I will say like, as a doula, this mm -hmm. job comes with inherent circadian disruption because baby labor they come when they come. to initiate at night, actually, because of the rise in melatonin, especially if a woman has a healthy circadian rhythm, labor onset so time of birth could be any time of day when the baby actually comes out but when does labor start almost always either in the evening or in the early morning because of melatonin peaks so that, that, makes that means sense. the calls tend to come in the middle of the night when I want to be resting and sleeping mm -hmm. and so that's another piece that where it has been helpful with look, helping figure out the recovery process after words which usually does look like getting some extra naps for several days following like a disruption. Like if I have to get up at four in the morning, it will actually take my body several days to rebound from that, to have solid scores where I can make it through the day without needing a nap. Oh, I think that's a good point because th there may be people that for whatever reason, they have a disruption to yeah. or a newborn <laughs> something that keeps you up in the, or a puppy, which is the crazy thing that I did. Um, oh how fun not yeah, anymore. he's now yeah I mean he's over he's a year now, but I thought that yeah. was the hardest I was like oh I forgot this middle of the night thing mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah to understand that you're going to need more rest the only other thing we didn't really talk about was circadian rhythms because temperature the, lots of things like when I just saw some yeah. interesting research about being social that we're social creatures and so there are certain times of the day when we would normally be social like mm -hmm. meal times and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And that can actually be a signal for our mm -hmm. circadian rhythms, but yeah. timing of day for eating, I think that might be helpful for people to know too. Absolutely. Yeah. I really wanted to touch on that with you because you are an expert in that area. And it's one of the things like, since I'm not a clinical provider, I'm not actually allowed to make recommendations to my clients, oh. but I can point to research and I can point to other professionals. There you say, go. Oh, you need to go and, you know, talk with this nutritionist <laughs> and see what she has to say about, you know, whatever, because like glucose intolerance is a huge problem yes. in pregnancy. Uh, absolutely. And it can completely, can completely change the course of what kind of care a woman is getting, how much testing she has to do, how likely her provider is going to recommend her for early induction, which, you know, there's pros and cons and the research is still really coming in on a lot right. of this stuff. So would right. you like to talk about mealtimes and how time of day affects digestion? Yeah. So it never occurred to me that we should eat. Well, it occurred to me during daylight hours makes sense, mm -hmm. but I also just didn't worry that much about it. And then we made these small shifts and some of my clients were willing to try, especially people who are really into fasting. They were mm -hmm. like, wait, 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 I don't know, but they were stalling and having problems. Their anxiety was going up. And so I said, okay, let's don't change what you're eating just which they were happy about <laughs> don't change what you're eating just shift when you eat so within about 30 minutes I say an hour because sometimes mornings are hectic for people but within 30 minutes is circadian for our circadian rhythms to be supported of sunrise so eating our breakfast within 30 minutes of sunrise and then just making sure that we eat our last meal before sunset that's mm -hmm. going to be the most helpful for our digestion for our leptin so people usually become leptin resistant before they become insulin resistant. 
And so that's just not something most people are ta taught. So with the light, getting out in the light, you're already cueing your body. You're letting your body know that it's morning. You're getting that nice dose of infrared and red light. So it's anti-inflammatory. There's enough blue there to tell your body to go ahead and make some, you know, get the cortisol going. But when we eat and it matches the light, it just, it will help with digestion and your body knows what to do. And when we eat um, after sunset and snack into the night, that disrupts our, micro our microbiome doesn't like that. Our gut bugs don't like that. Um, and we can't digest fully everything in our body, which means that you're not going to re you're not going to get into deep levels of autophagy and apoptosis, which is how our body cleans itself in the night. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's from the beginning we've been talking about it's this whole cascade of yeah. things that when it's running well and everything is matched, because when you're mismatched you've got all kinds of weird firing, but when mm -hmm. there's a match to your natural environment and what's best for the human body and human digestion, you're going to feel a whole lot better. Yeah. And I'm glad to you brought up the autophagy um, aspect because that's something that, you know, pregnant women have been told for a long time to fear ketosis uh -huh. and not yeah. to, not to fast. And research is starting to come in that, oh, actually um, autophagy is extremely important for the process of implantation, for example. And so many processes that are happening require the body to have healthy autophagy going on. It makes sense. That's the body's way of cleaning itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is this huge misconception about it. And so for yeah. pregnant women, based on the research that I've done, if they are, because sometimes though, you know, their caloric needs are so high yes. and if they miss breakfast, they won't have enough time in the daylight to get, get all, of all of the nutrition they need. In that case, it mm -hmm. seems like carbohydrates particularly are just more disruptive after dark than Correct. others. And same thing, like if there's a really short daylight window. Yes, that's correct. That's the research that I'm seeing. That's also what Dr. Jack Cruz was been talking about. If you're going to have okay. carbohydrates earlier in the day, but really, especially if somebody's got disruption, that fat and the, I mean, the essential amino acids, the essential fat, fatty acids, that's mm -hmm. where you want to really focus. So yeah, later in the mm -hmm. day, so having like a little piece of salmon or a little bit of steak, or, mm -hmm. you know, having that later in the day is going to be less disruptive to your gut bugs and your digestion mm -hmm. and your blood yeah. glucose and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And that was one of the, we were talking about kind of specific nutrients earlier. And one of the yeah. ones, I guess there's four, um, tryptophan is yeah. the precursor to serotonin, which then turns into melatonin. So that high protein diet. And I mean, it turns into a bunch of other things as well, but as far as the things we've been talking about today, right. that tryptophan is super important, vital nutrient for healthy circadian rhythms and healthy hormones. Yeah. And the most bioavailable way of getting those amino acids to make your neurotransmitters is going to come from animal sources of protein. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are, you know, they're, they just aren't aware of that. Mm -hmm. so, and the DHA really the primary way we get DHA is through seafood yeah. and you can there, I mean, algae has it, but we don't, humans don't digest algae. So you no. have to get a supplement and then that's the supplement is never going to be as good as mm -hmm. getting it from our food. So yeah. So getting a mama to just, mm -hmm. especially a mama that has really wants to be plant-based. I want to honor that and also make sure that she's getting everything that she needs. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I love pointing folks to Lily Nichols um, yes. work that I mentioned earlier. She has a really fantastic chapter in her book, Real Food for Pregnancy, that is about the vegetarian plant-based diets in pregnancy and some of the specific, you know, she does a good job of addressing the challenges yeah. with that without coming off as judgmental, but also saying like, really, really look at this and really consider. And really then, consider it. And if, mm -hmm. if, and if no other time in your life while you're developing a baby, mm -hmm. um, because just for your ba ba baby's brain health, but also, um, you know, taurine, which is an amino acid that is great for digestion mm -hmm. and it can be really helpful for people. And that's only found in animal foods. Yeah. 
And so it's like, well, I mean, yeah. it's not just the typical B12. Everybody thinks of like, oh, I just need to take some B12. There are other nutrients that are important too. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually kind of an, an interesting anecdote that I like to use from the animal kingdom, which is mm -hmm. baby ducklings will eat tons and tons and tons of bugs. And once they reach a certain size, then they'll switch to a mostly plant-based diet. But for the time when they're growing, they're really eating majority bugs and things. And so the babies, even though the, the mamas and the babies are foraging in the same place, they're fishing out the specific things, things they that need. they need for their life stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've lost a little bit of our ability to to do that to instinctively <laughs> forage out. So I yeah. want people to get back to that. Mm -hmm. but I love the work you're, I love your website. I love that you're Thank you. helping all the mamas and the mamas that want to be mamas. And mm -hmm. I just think that that's such an important piece of helping humanity. Mm -hmm. um, it is. And especially like you mentioned earlier that the circadian rhythm is set in this time for the newborn baby. Mm -hmm. And so if we can catch mamas at this time, it can potentially have lifelong benefit for the baby and the future generation in that line, that family yeah. line. So it is so important. Yeah. And damage that had been done by grandma and great grandma yeah. and on can be reversed. Mm -hmm. like yeah, that. exactly. We have multiple generations now that have lived under these artificial lights that are missing frequencies that our bodies really need to be mm -hmm. absorbing. So it is right. a, a great opportunity to correct course that we have right now with all this new information. And I'm like, correct course, people. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're not getting rid of technology. We love it, but we got to yeah. use it smartly and we got to understand that our light, the light is more important than anybody ever realizes. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. And for those newborn babies too, there's so much like, you know, protect them from sunburn and all of that. And so that's a place where like the D-Minder app can be helpful if you're not confident with, you know, going out for that and to find when there's a low UV index to take that baby out. But it's so important because they don't make melatonin, they don't really respond to darkness the way that's that right. adults do. So that's a really interesting thing. They require more social cues that you were talking about, the socialization. They need mama to be awake and happy and cheerful and chattering with them in the daytime and to go outside because the light still will stimulate their wakefulness and so there's kind of a unique thing in the post in the postpartum period where they the mom and baby um need that really morning sunshine to get baby to be sleeping well uh yeah. as soon as possible <laughs> I can just see mama's running out in the morning light now if this makes my baby sleep I will do it yeah exactly yeah <laughs> because yeah you can have a baby in a dark room and it will just stay in that you know it's used to the dark womb and being up whenever it wants to <laughs> right yeah 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 so it is yeah the sunshine piece comes into play huge in the postpartum and as well with mood disorders so yes for the, mom, and for the whole family yeah, the whole family. But I also think it's important for people to realize it doesn't need to be sunshiny, beautiful day to get yeah. the frequency. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure everybody understands. Yeah, I'm right? so glad you say that. Yeah, because <laughs> I've yeah, talked with it people too. It can be too. dreary like, oh, and rainy yeah. and the light frequencies that we're talking about that we need are still available yeah. from dawn to dusk all year mm -hmm. round. Yeah. And if you can't get out, like, you know, in the first few days healing time, of course, and mama can hardly you know, make it to the bathroom. So going outside isn't feasible, but if you can open a window yes. at the right time of day, um, just the ambient light coming through that actual window has frequencies in it that aren't present from the light bulbs. Exactly. Yeah. Do whatever you have to do to mm -hmm. get that. Yeah. Get that light. <laughs> and then whatever you have to do to be in the dark at night and wearing mm -hmm. an, I wear an eye mask now because oh. I just, yeah, it's easier because my husband doesn't like it to be totally dark. He's not um, on, totally on board. It's okay. Mm -hmm, We're getting yeah. there. Um, yeah. But I, it's fine. I, I've gotten used to it and I like it and it's an easy solution for, for people. So there are mm -hmm. ways to do these things. Yeah. I like the little sleep lights too for postpartum because, you know, you can just tap them on and off easily or have a motion detector. And then that way you can have some light if you need to be out breastfeeding and doing diaper changes. Because even if it doesn't affect the baby as much, it still does really affect, affect the mom. Yeah, the mom. Yeah. yeah. 
And so if you get like a blast of white light, it will set your melatonin back by several hours. So like one trip to the bathroom can actually have really devastating effects if you have full spectrum bulbs in the bathroom. Yep. Got to get those good yep. light bulbs or the, the <laughs> dim, the, yeah, dim everything. And the worst thing people can do, we didn't have phones when I, I mean, I guess we oh. did. We didn't mm -hmm. have iPhones and whatnot when I was having babies, but now people mm -hmm. get on their phone. Yeah, I know and that light is so night. bright. Yeah, yes. it's so bright. It's and then, yeah, so I think that has, you know, there's a lot of evidence coming in about the link between that kind of light and depression. And yes, the light is really worth being mindful of. <laughs> right, and and yeah. the depression and d the dopamine, uh, and we we got we could go on and on. So we'll stop. Yeah, there. We Just tell people like <laughs> you, you're gonna want to learn more as much as you can about quantum health mm -hmm. and the light and circadian rhythms and earthing and matching your food to the season. All yeah, of it. yeah, it's very nature based. Is you know, yeah, give, it really exactly. is. And so whether nature given or God given or whatever you believe, like the fact is that connecting with yeah the space that's around us that is mm -hmm. a really big giver of health and vitality yeah it's mm -hmm. meant to help us heal we'll let yes. it <laughs> if, if we will let it yeah I know so like, the, the nature is always patient it's always waiting for us it's always it's up to us to hold up our side of the relationship like we were talking about with attachment theory and in this case the sun and earth that, you know, the sun is the secure one in the relationship. You can always trust exactly. what time of day the sun says it is. You can't trust your clock the same way you can trust the sun. Oh, that's a beautiful way to end. I love that. <laughs> we could have started with that too. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Nico. I've enjoyed talking to you. This is so awesome. I always love hearing your questions too, when we're on the calls. So bright. So awesome. oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so curious about all this and so excited to apply it because there's just so much potential and, um, you know, we can just have a totally different world for our children and that just motivates me beyond belief. Yes, I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It was great chatting. <laughs>